our eminent speakers tonight, Dr. Amr Hashim and Dr. Amr Hani Safwat. And the session moderator is uh, Professor Muhammad Ibrahim. Uh, just before we start, little reminder, if you didn't get an email of confirmation uh, of the anesthesia, of the Critical Care Ultrasound Updates Conference uh, next week, please email me immediately. All the invitations were sent out in the last couple of weeks. So if you didn't get your invitation yet, please feel free to email me or text me uh, to get your invitation sorted. Uh, we are closing the registration uh, on 25th of this uh, month, uh, just for technical reason to sort all the invitations out and prepare the certificates of attendance. So uh, we need to close the registration. If you didn't register and you won't attend this conference, so please hurry up um, and register as soon as you can. Thanks very much. And I'm giving the phone and the mic now to uh, Professor Dr. Mohammed Ibrahim. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll start our... Uh presentation today with my uh, dear friend, colleague, Dr. Amr Hashim. Dr. Amr Hashim will speak about a very special and a very interesting topic. I think all the anesthetists have to know what is this and how they manage a patient with cardiac implantable electronic device. Uh, Dr. Amr uh, Hashim is a, a lecturer of cardiothoracic anesthesia in Alexander University and is now is working as a consultant of cardiothoracic anesthesia in Freeman Hospital, United Kingdom. I hope we will get, uh, we will all of us uh, bring, we we'll do a brainstorming of the new concepts, our new issues about this subject. Please, Dr. Amr, you have a mic. Thank you so much, Professor Mohammed Ibrahim. Uh, I'll start uh, um, now. Right, so we'll start with the anesthetic management of the cardiac, uh, management of cardiac uh, uh, implantable devices or patients with cardiac implantable electronic yeah. devices. Uh, so cardiac implantable electronic devices are usually uh, includes the pacemakers and the AICDs over the automatic implantable cardiac uh, defibrillators. Um, for, um, we can also add the uh, ventricular assist devices if this is like a, a comprehensive thing. So that's all the three of the devices are included in the cardiac implantable electronic devices, the VAS or the ventricular assist device. But today we'll only concentrate on the pacemakers and the uh, cardiac implantable or, or, or AICDs or the automatic in, implantable cardiac devices. Uh, so the outlines of this uh, lecture will be the CIED, which is cardiac implantable electronic devices technology and the indications of their use, the anesthetic considerations for um, the uh, 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 patients with such devices, and uh, the uh, uh, guidelines, huge references. We use the practice advisory for the preoperative management of patients with cardiac implantable electronic devices. 2020, and this is very important for all the analysis to have a look at, and the European Society guidelines on the indications of cardiac pacing, and the American uh, guidelines as well for the bradycardia, cardiac consultation, and uh, automatic implantable cardiac devices implantation. Uh, implanted cardiac devices, only the first of them was the external pacemakers in 1950s. In the 60s, implantable transvenous pacemakers evolved. And the main indication was the syncopal attacks, which were called sort of Stokes, Adam Stokes uh, uh, syncopal attacks, which occur with a complete heart block. With advances in the cardiology and technology, the indications for these ICDs has been uh, uh, broadened lately. So we have like um, some questions uh, in the uh, next couple of slides. Uh, that we uh, are going to pass through, and you will find I'll give the answer at the last of the at the at the end of this uh, 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 presentation. So, for the following questions, which is true and which is false? 
Preoperative bifascicular block with first degree AV block, should the patient have a transvenous pacemaker before the operation, irrespective of cardiovascular symptoms, is this true or false? Emergency surgery has symptomatic uh, third degree heart block, and the patient should have always a permanent pacemaker inserted before the surgery uh, can be safely proceed or not, true or false. And the asymptomatic type two second degree AV block is not not an indication for pacemaker insertion, pacemaker insertion before elective surgery. And the last one, which is the asymptomatic first degree AV block is extremely unlikely to progress to second degree block in the perioperative period. And as a result, they don't require preoperative pacing. Uh, another four questions, one regarding the magnet, is the magnet placed over the pacemaker devices, is it recommended as an alternative to formal device reprogramming before an operation involving diathermy? or if pulseless shockable rhythm occurs interoperatively in a patient with a program inactivated implantable, implantable cardioverter or ICD, the first step would be the page, the cardiology uh, technician to e enable the ICD or just progress without telling them. If a pulseless shockable rhythm occur interoperatively in a patient with an implanted pacemaker, the patient should immediately be externally defibrillated. And the last question on a chest X-ray, a film one can most reliably distinguish between an ICD and a permanent pacemaker by looking only at generator box. So these are eight questions uh, um, and you'll find the answers at the end, just not to waste the time. And if you go through the presentation, understand these things well, uh, you will be able to answer the questions uh, at the end. So what are the guidelines for the implantation of cardiac pacemakers and antiarrhythmic devices? Use these uh, European Society guidelines, they considered patients for anti-bradycardia pacemaker therapy, divided them into patients with persistent bradycardia and patients with intermittent bradycardia. And persistent bradycardia is either a sinus node disease or an AV block. And this AV block is either with sinusism or with atrial fibrillation. Intermittent bradycardia is uh, either ECG documented intermittent bradycardia or only suspected, which is an ECG undocumented. And in these cases, the ECG documented is either intrinsic or extrinsic, or is functional. And the ECG undocumented is under either bundle branch of rock, reflex syncope, unexplained syncope. Uh, and they progress later with management of these to the uh, pacemakers. Uh, bundle branch of rock and unexplained syncope, they classify this into ejection fraction patients with less than 35% and ejection fraction patients with more than 35%. For this, they consider the ICDC RTD, and we'll know later what does this mean. And the patients more than 35% will consider this uh, 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 carotid sinus massage or uh, uh, the electrophysiology study. And if it is positive with appropriate therapy, if negative, we consider the uh, implantable loop recorder, which records the events, if it is positive, only appropriate therapy, if negative, only clinical follow-up. So what is a, a permanent cardiac pacemaker and what does it consist of? It consists usually of a pulse generator, which a device generating electrical impulses, leads and electrodes, which are connected to the heart, used for sensing and the pacing of the heart. And the leads and electrodes can either be endocardial uh, leads through the intravenous route or uh, uh, epicardial or myocardial through a via uh, subcostal approach. So may find generator in the chest wall and may find the generator in the abdominal uh, wall. Um, the leads are then attached to the pulse generator device and implanted under the patient's skin and it may also be inserted deep to the muscle layers. This is usually a lithium iodide battery that we use. This is the uh, uh, classification or the uh, nomenclature of the uh, which was uh, uh, done by the North American Pacing and Electrophysiology and the British Pacing uh, Electrophysiology, which uh, describes the mode of pacing uh, by first letter, second, third, fourth, and fifth letter. The first letter is uh, signifies the chamber which is paced, which is non paced Z as O or A as atrium, V as ventricle, D as dual atrial and ventricle uh, pacing. And this is the chamber sensed letter, uh, second letter. It is either O, A, V, and D again. And the third letter is the response to sensing. Is it no response, zero, triggered response, which means 
uh, uh, triggering of an uh, myocardial or endocardial impulse or inhibition of an impulse, uh, which means that the pacemaker inhibits itself. So this is very important to know. Uh, 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 inhibition, the, the pacemaker doesn't inhibit the heart. It doesn't inhibit the uh, conduction through the heart. It inhibits itself when it senses uh, 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 an impulse which is coming from the heart. Dual, which is uh, both triggering and inhibition. And the uh, fourth letter is the rate modulation, uh, which is either O, R, uh, O, none. There is no rate modulation. R, there is rate modulation. And the last one is the multi-site pacing, which means that this, this uh, pacemaker uh, uh, is placed on more than one side. So it's zero, O as uh, none, A atrial only, V ventricle, and D it's uh, placing both the atria and the ventricles. Um, so this is the uh, nomenclature that we uh, uh, have here. Uh, what are the pacing modes that we know? This is the asynchronous pacing mode, single chamber pacing mode, dual chamber pacing mode, rate responsive pacing, and anti tachycardia pacing, and we will explain each of them. Asynchronous or fixed rate mode, which is the uh, preset rate. So if I put on the pacemaker a rate of 60, it will give 60. And this is regardless what is the inherent heart rate is. Uh, and this can be AOO, so only atrial, ventricular, so only pacing the ventricle VOO, or dual DOO, dual uh, uh, um, pacing uh, of both chambers, but with fixed non-changing rate. Uh, what's the issues with this? This is competition and the ventricular fibrillation are the potential complications when you know, the normal heart rate appears. So when the patient heart rate starts to reappear again, there's a competition and maybe VF. If an impulse is generated at the time at the patient's own T wave, theoretically, this could induce the ventricular fibrillation or what is called the R on T phenomena. So this is a part which is not absolute refractory period. It's going through the relative refractory period and stimulating the heart during this period may initiate a, a ventricular arrhythmias. And this is not theoretically. We saw this practically in patients where with pacemakers, which uh, uh, have or which go into uh, ventricular uh, uh, fibrillation um, when the heart rate starts to reappear and the pacemaker is not in uh, a synchronizing mode. Um, so this is the first mode. The second mode is a single chamber uh, uh, demand pacing. This mode uh, only uh, paces one chamber. The most uh, uh, popular is the VVI, which is ventricular pacing, ventricular sensing, and inhibition is the response. And this is a, 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 a very important mode that we use in patients we, the, uh, uh, who lack atrial uh, sharing in the cardiac output. So a patient with AF, for example, chronic AF, uh, should be paced with this mode because anyway, the atrium is not sharing. We, we are not getting anything from pacing the, ventric, the atrium. Uh, Paced rhythm here, as we can see. So this is what in this ECG, there is an atrial pacing, atrial pacing, atrial pacing, and this is atrial sensing. Well, this disappeared. So this is the own rhythm of the heart. Atrial sensing, sensing, sensing. So this is AAI 60 beats per minute. This is another rhythm where we can find the pacing stimulus before the QRS complex, pacing, ventricular pacing, ventricular pacing. This is own rhythm, so this is ventricular sensing. So the heart, the, the machine here sensed a QRS complex, so it didn't, it didn't, it inhibited itself and it didn't pace. And this is ventricular pacing, pacing, sensing, and pacing. And so this is VVI of 60 uh, uh, beats. Uh, the third type is the dual chamber AV sequential pacing. So you usually call it uh, a sequential, AV sequential pacing or DD. Uh, uh, D if it is uh, uh, dual pacing, sensing, and uh, both responses. And this requires two pacemaker leads, one in the right atrium, the other in the right ventricle. Atrium is stimulated to contract the first, then the, uh, we adjust the PR interval. And there is a range of adjusting this PR interval on the machine if it is an external pacemaker. If it is already uh, an internal pacemaker, this is adjusted by the cardiologist. And the ventricle is then stimulated to contract after the atrium 
uh, and the appropriate PR interval that we adjust between 120 and 200 milliseconds. Uh, DDD is the commonest type. Dual chamber pacemakers provide the important benefits of maintaining the AV synchrony and uh, thus benefiting from the atrial and ventricular contractions and the whole cardiac output. So this is another pace, pacing rhythm here in the ECG. This is an atrial sensed, so no pacing, ventricular paced. And this is a sensed, no pacing, ventricular pacing, and so on. So this is a DDD with sensing and pacing of both atria and ventricle. Uh, and this is another one with atrial sensing, ventricular sensing, sensing, sensing. So all this is sensing. So this is a, a, a DDD of 60, but the heart rate is 120. So it is not pacing because already the heart rate is above the uh, uh, minimum rate that we set on the machine. And here the machine is sensing every beat and thus it's inhibiting itself from uh, any stimulation. Sometimes in external pacemakers, there's called the tracking uh, uh, of the pacemaker with the pacemaker, uh, uh, even if it is at 60, it tracks the uh, uh, complexes above 60. And if this tracking uh, needs a stimulation, it stimulates. So if there is only a P wave, it puts another QRS complex for it. If there is only a QRS, it puts another P. And so these external pacemakers, usually used in cardiac surgery, uh, sometimes there is atrial uh, or, or ventricular tracking or dual tracking, where even if you put 60, they can pace to 120 if the rate above 60 is not full P PQRS complexes as expected. Uh, this is another one. Uh, as well with atrial pacing and the ventricular pacing. So this is fully DDD uh, pacing uh, for this patient. So what's meant by the rate responsive or adaptive pacing? It's called adaptive or rate responsive. So, and this is the fourth letter that we talked about. Uh, in these patients with the rate modulating pacing, patients who are, they are chronotropically incompetent. That means heart rate cannot reach appropriate levels during exercise or meet other metabolic demands. This is chronic atrial fibrillation with slow ventricular response is an example. Drug treatment with negative chronotropic drugs as beta blockers or sick sinus syndrome. So these patients, whenever they do exercise or need more heart rate contribution in the cardiac output or increasing the cardiac output, they fail. And so they are called chronotropically incompetent. And these pacemakers use either a primary response, which is catecholamine level or autonomic nervous system activity to pace, or secondary responses as a QTR interval, respiratory rate, minute ventilation, temperature, pH, stroke volume, pre-ejection interval, mixed venous saturation, peak endocardial acceleration, which are all as a result of uh, increased demand, oxygen demand, uh, 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 and increased uh, uh, in response to exercise or any other stimulus. And the tertiary response is by vibration or acceleration through uh, 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 muscles of the uh, from exercise, for example, that may lead to a response uh, and increase in the rate. Um, how can we choose the pacing mode? Uh, rough guideline first. So the rough guidelines is SA node disease. No AV node disease or bundle of his AAI could be placed. AV nodal de conduction disease, which requires DDD or DDI is appropriate if there is a, a, a conduction disease. So if there is AV nodal conduction, DDD is or DDI is the best. Uh, SA node disease, AV node disease or lower conduction system disease whose heart rate do not respond to an increase in metabolic demands should be considered for, as we said, rate responsive pacing. Uh, episodes of symptomatic bradycardia due to SA node or AV node disease may benefit from placing, placement of a single chamber VVI. So if we said before, if there is the atrium is not contributing and we need to save the patient with a ventricular pacing to save the cardiac output, we can use the VVI uh, pacemaker. Uh, neurocardiogenic syncope due to carotid sinus hypersensitivity, vasovical syncope, and the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can be treated with DDD or dual chamber, and electromechanical asynchrony and intraventricular conduction block can be treated by what is called the cardiac resynchronization therapy, 
which we will discuss later on. So if there is a heart failure or both the left ventricle is not uh, uh, synchronized mechanically with the right ventricle, and uh, if both are not synchronizing with the atrium as well, we can use the cardiac resynchronization therapy or C CRT therapy. This is a rough guideline. But there is also the European guidelines. So if we have a sinus node uh, disease, if it is persistent uh, uh, or, uh, uh, or intermittent, and if it is AV block, we classify it as persistent or intermittent as well. So sinus nodes persistent, is either chronotropic incompetence, as we said before, or no chronotropic incompetence. This will also always no chronotropic incompetence where you require the rate modulation. If there is chronotropic incompetence, no rate modulation. So this one can go with DDDR plus AVM, first choice, and AAIR as a second choice. The other one, DDD plus AVM, which is atrioventricular. Uh, 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 delay mechanism that we, that you used to do, we talked about the atrial ventricular uh, uh, distance or the, uh, the time between the atrium and the ventricular uh, contraction, which responds responds to the PR interval, and the second choice is AAR. If there is intermittent sinus node disease, the first choice DDR, second or plus AVM, DDDR plus AVM, third is AAIR, and if there is AV block with persistent uh, AV block with sinus node disease, DDDR, DDD, VVIR, no SND, so DDD, DDD, VDD, or VVIR. And this is the very important thing I told you about before. Whenever there is an AV block persistence with AF, whenever you see the AF word, usually go for the VVI. Never go for a DDD, never go for AI. Always, whenever there is an AVF, do not use the atrial lead if it is present or if it is not present, we will not put it anyway. And this as well, the AV block with intermittent AV block. So here we can use DDD plus AVM. And if there is intermittent AV block with AAF, always VVI, as I told you before. So the anesthetist should recognize those patients who require a prophylactic pacemaker before surgery can proceed. This is very important. And in emergency surgeries with no time, external cardiac pacemaker can be used. So the indications for the perioperative uh, or preoperative pacing is the same as the indications uh, for the pacing, uh, even if the patient is not in perioperative. So for example, this is the abnormality. This is the indication for pacing. If there is a patient as symptomatic first degree AV block, this is not indicated. Second degree AV block with associated symptoms, bradycardia, regardless of the type and site, if the patient is symptomatic, this is a golden rule. Patient is symptomatic, starting from second degree AV block, it is always indicated. Type one, second degree AV block with or without symptoms, controversial still, some say yes, some say no, it will progress, it won't progress, but mostly if this patient is not symptomatic now, we can uh, not use, we can now not use the pacing. Uh, type 2 second degree AV block without symptoms with narrow QRS complex, re reasonable to perform. Type 2 second degree AV block without symptoms and wide QRS complex, it is indicated. Um, and second degree AV block with symptoms, it's always indicated. And bifascicular block with or without first degree third block, uh, first, first degree AV block, which is the trifascicular block. If we, if we have bifascicular block, and the first degree AV block on top, this is a, what is called the trifascicular block. So if this is without symptoms, it is not indicated. It's very important. The symptoms here are now the main cornerstone for pacing the patients uh, 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 in, in, in special types of the blocks. Uh, bifascicular block with, with or without first degree AV block with symptoms indicated. A chronic bifascicular block with type two second degree AV block is indicated and bifascicular block associated with AMI, which is acute myocardial infarction, may be considered. And third degree AV block is always indicated, uh, uh, very important here. This is the most important uh, for the anesthetists. There are other indications from, from the cardiologist's points, which are not very interesting for us. Um, we uh, previously uh, mentioned the cardiac resynchronization therapy for heart failure patients. And uh, uh, what do we mean by this? So. What's meant by ventricular dyssynchrony? Abnormal ventricular conduction, which is resulting in a mechanical delay. 
So if we look at the ECG here, this is a, an ECG which shows intra, interventricular conduction delay. So one ventricle conduction to the other is delayed, which results in mechanical dyssynchrony between them. And we can see why it's QRS complex in this IVCD, which is interventricular conduction delay. Typically, it is a left bundle branch block, as we can see here. Okay, and a poor systolic function and the impaired diastolic function as well. So what are the clinical consequences of this? There's always abnormal interventricular septal wall motion, superstar motion abnormality, reduced DP by TT, which is a very important determinant of the contractility, and reduced the diastolic filling time. So both impaired contractility, systole and diastole, and prolonged MR duration if there is an MR. Uh, and this, if we can see, look at the both of the uh, echoes here, this is a resynchronization off and resynchronization on, and we can uh, monitor the difference in the position of the septum and in the shape and geometry of the heart uh, uh, as well and the dilatation of the LV. And here it is less dilated and the septum is more, more central, uh, uh, septum not deviated towards the uh, right side as we can see here. What's the cardiac resynchronization therapy? Again, it is the therapy intent of atrial synchronization, synchronized by ventricular pacing to restore the ventricular synchrony. And this complements the drug therapy. Uh, so we should first start with, with drug therapy and then proceed with this CRRT. Um, cardiac resynchronization in association uh, with an optimized AV delay improves the hemodynamic performance by forcing the left ventricle to contract and give it time as well to relax. So better contraction, better filling and relaxation. And this is the ECG differences here. And this leads to the coordination of activation of the ventricles and the septal wall motion abnormalities as well. So this ECG is completely different from this ECG. The time here for conduction is completely different from this one. And uh, 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 this will make a, a great difference in the systolic output and in the filling in during the diastolic time. Indications for this are symptomatic despite stable optimal medical therapy. So optimal medical therapy is not working. Moderate to severe heart failure, NEHA classific class three and four. And QRS more than or equal 130 meters per second, uh, milliseconds, sorry. And the LV ejection fraction is less than or equal to 35%. And in this uh, as a study, we can see here the magnitude of benefit of the CRT. So the maximum benefit with the base of the triangle with in patients with wider QRS, left bundle branch block, females, non-ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy. Uh, then we will go to the implantal cardioverter uh, 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 defibrillator survey, which is AICD or automatic inter, inter, implantable cardioverter uh, defibrillators. Uh, these ICDs, uh, what are, these devices. This uh, device responds to any dysrhythmias by delivering an internal electrical shock within 15 seconds. So we have to wait for 15 seconds to make sure that this is shock is delivered. The ICD system consists of a pulse generator, the same as the pacemaker, leads the same for dysrhythmias detection and for the current delivery. In addition to internal uh, defibrillation, an ICD can produce anti-tachycardia uh, and the anti bradycardia pacing and synchronized uh, 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 cardioversion. Uh, so um, um, it's not only the function of the ICDs is to defibrillate the heart. The function is can extend to anti tachycardia and anti bradycardia pacing and synchronized cardioversion as well. Um, what ICDs they allow storage and analysis of events later on. They measure the RR interval, categorize the rate as normal, too fast, uh, with short RR interval or too slow, and deliver the shock accordingly. Uh, when the device detects a sufficient number of short RR intervals within a period of time, it will declare a tachycardia episode. And then in response to this, the internal computer will decide between anti-tachycardia pacing and shock basing, and this is based on algorithms. Uh, there is an also a nomenclature for this and the coding, the same, uh, uh, there is another coding here for the AICDs, uh, uh, which is different from the codes 
for the pacemakers. So the first letter is the shock chambers. Is it non-atrium ventricle or dual? And the second letter, anti-tachycardia chambers, non-atrium ventricular and dual. And the third letter is tachycardia detection. Is it uh, electro electrogram or hemodynamic detection of the tachycardia? And the, this is uh, uh, the fourth letter, anti tachycardia pacing. Is this uh, uh, AICD uh, having uh, an anti tachycardia pacing? Uh, and which chamber is it non atrium ventricular or dual as well? So, what do we mean by, by anti tachycardia pacing? If we see here, this is a patient in uh, 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 VTAC, and uh, this patient here, we can see the very wide QRS complex uh, in this patient's uh, VF or VTAC with the 440 uh, milliseconds. And what we do here is that in addition to defibrillation, ICDs have this anti-tachycardia function, and uh, 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 this will attempt to stop the re-entrant VTAC by briefly pacing the ventricles at a rate slightly faster than the VTAC. So they will take over and they will uh, pace the heart in a rate higher than the VTAC rate, okay? And it usually delivers eight pacing impulses with at least two attempts. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight impulses with a shorter 340 milliseconds. And after that, the, we can see here that it reverted back to synathrism. If it doesn't revert to synathrism after two attempts of this anti-tachycardia pacing, the AICD will go to shock uh, of the patient. Uh, this is the generator in the chest X-ray. This is the generator of the AICD. And we can see here the leads and wires. And then this is very important. This is the coil of the wire. And this is one coil in the superior vena cava. And the other coil here, it is in the RV or, or the right ventricle. And if we see here the direction of shock from the cathode, which is the RV uh, uh, coil and the shock propagates towards both the SVC and the uh, uh, generator, uh, and these are considered as the anode. So this is one type of configuration of the AICD. AICDs are not always simple and are not always the same, but this is one common form of uh, propagation of the current in an ICD. And whenever we have this wire, it is thin. When it comes thickened here, this is the coil of the AICD. It's usually one in the SVC and one in the RV, as we can see here. So what are the guidelines for the uh, device-based therapy of cardiac rhythm abnormalities? There are indications for ICD implantation, uh, class one cardiac arrest due to VF or VTAC, which is not due to a transient or reversible cause, spontaneous sustained VTAC in association with structural heart disease, syncope of undetermined origin, uh, 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 with clinically relevant hemodynamically significant VTAC or VF, and which was induced by EP studies. So if the EP studies, uh, uh, which we are doing, induces VF or TAC causing hemodynamically stable, this is an indication, even if the patient uh, 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 was not symptomatic before. And non-sustained VTAC in patients with coronary artery disease, prior MI, LV dysfunction, inducible VF or sustained VTAC at EP study that is not suppressible by class one antiarrhythmic drugs, spontaneous sustained VTAC in patients without structural heart disease, not amenable to other treatments. And we, class 2A patients with left ventricular ejection fraction less than or equal to 30% at least one month post MRI and three months post CABG. This is now a common indication that we are used. And this is all sufficient for us, the class one and the class two B uh, indications. Um, uh, what's about the anesthesia for these patients with the, AR, with the CIEDs or the implantable devices? Preoperative evaluation is very important. So routine systematic workup focusing on the cardiovascular status. This is a, or usually a cardiac patient that we have here. The anesthetist needs to establish the presence, location, and the reason of the CIED by focused history, review of medical records, and physical examination. There may be scars over the chest or the upper abdomen, which is the site of the generator. And chest X-ray is very important, confirms the presence and the location of the devices. And we have a, 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 some X-rays at the end of the presentation to have a look at. Um, 
preoperative assessment is usually a device assessment and a patient assessment. Device assessment, patient evaluation, and preparation before the uh, uh, procedure. So the anesthetist then needs to answer the following questions. Number one, what is the type of the device and the program mode? Number two, is the device functioning properly or not? How dependent is the patient on the device? Uh, and what is the probability of the electromagnetic interference in theater? And how do we minimize this risk? So these four questions are the cornerstones of the management. First question, defining the type of the device. We look at the manufacturer's ID card from the patient or other source, chest X-ray studies if, the, if there is no data available, presence of shocking coils as we saw in the right ventricle in the X-ray, sometimes also in the superior vena cava, vendor's database, so if we go online, see the vendor's database, pacemaker clinical records, uh, review clinical records of the patient, pacemaker clinical records, clinic, if the patient is attending a cardiac, uh, or with, or a cardiac rhythm clinic, and the consultation with a cardiologist is very important uh, for defining the type of the device. Determining the, if the device is, the second question, is the device functioning properly or not? Pacemakers can fail early or late. Early failure is usually due to displaced or broken electrodes. Late failure is usually due to the battery failure. Pacemaker should be checked where possible by a pacemaker technologist or what we call electrophysiologists before proceeding to surgery, if we have time for that. Determining if the device is functioning properly uh, is if not possible. So we said that we should, where possible, examine by electrophysiology. But if not possible, we can do some maneuvers. Slow intrinsic heart rate below the pacemaker by carotid massage or by sulfur maneuver. Uh, then if this pacemaker is functioning, it will take over the heart rate after bradycardia happens. Uh, a second method, if using a magnet, we can use a magnet. If we put a magnet on the pacemaker, if the rate change, changes uh, to uh, uh, a fixed rate, then this was functioning and we moved it to a, a fixed rate. But this is, however, magnets are not always recommended because of their unpredictable response, only if we are in need of this. Third question, is the patient is dependent on CIED or not? Reliably, this we can be done through reliably consultation of a cardiologist. This is the most reliable or the pacemaker technician. Verbal history or indication uh, in the medical record as well. History of successful AV node ablation that resulted in CIED placement. No spontaneous ventricular activity when the pacemaker function is programmed to VVI at the lowest programmable rate. So this is done by the electrophysiologist in the presence of the anesthetist when uh, uh, the, uh, starts to manipulate or put his own magnet on the pacemaker and he changes the mode to the lowest possible VVI rate. If, the low, if he changes to this, the heart should take over if it is not dependent on the pacemaker. But if it is dependent on the pacemaker, it will fall, the heart, down, the heart rate will fall down to the lowest programmable part of VVI that the electrophysiologist put on and in that and at, at that point we should stop and say this patient is dependent on CIED let's put him on a fixed mode rate. Uh, ECG is very important and doing ECG we can recognize the pacing spikes and if the patient is dependent on this pacing spike so if the pacing spikes are regular so all the ECG spikes are paced spikes we can say that this is dependent for example. Uh, what about the fourth question to answer? Electromagnetic and the mechanical interference. So the electromechanical interference, what does it cause on the pacemaker? What's the effect? It may change it to asynchronous mode. It may cause inhibition or triggering. It may reset to big backup mode or reprogramming. It may damage the electronic circuit. It may cause burn injury to the myocardium. Inappropriate activation of the rate adaptive feature and the anti-tachycardia therapy. Electromagnetic interference in patients with ICDs can cause inappropriate or inhibition of the tachycardia therapy at all. So the ICD could become uh, useless. Um, so what are the conditions that warrant pacemaker reprogramming? If this pacemaker is dependent on the patient, uh, if it's a major procedure in abdominal chest, 
rate adaptive fe feature of a pacemaker, suspension of anti-tachycardia function, surgical procedures with high chances of EMI or electromagnetic interference. At this point, this warrant pacemaker programming and we should take care. There are three groups of patients most at high risk of EMI and these patients uh, who have a pacemaker dependent rhythm that's uh, uh, complete heart block, patients with ICD, patients with pacemaker uh, with a rate responsive function, and uh, these are the three categories. Uh, high probability of AMI in electrocotary use, lithotripsy, ECT, radiation therapy, MRI, and orthopedic procedures. Um, one of uh, electrocotary, for example, very, very important. And uh, they use the uh, 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 radio frequency between 300 and 500 kilohertz. EMI generated by the electrocautery. So it depends on the distance and the orientation of the current to the patient's device and leads. And it, uh, uh, it's very important to reduce the risk of the diathermy. You can use a bipolar diathermy or even ultrasonic harmonic scalpel. If unipolar is a must position so that the current does not pass near the implanted devices or leads, infrequent short bursts at lowest feasible energy uh, uh, used, temporary pacing and defibrillation should be available in the uh, perioperative period. Uh, for external defibrillators, if we are using the external defibrillators with uh, uh, CIEDs, they, these produce very large energies and they may damage the circuits. And um, for the generators in the left pectoral region, we can use apex anterior, apex posterior positions. And for generators in the right pectoral region, apex posterior positions are uh, more appropriate. Uh, what about the radio frequency ablation? In patients with dysrhythmias associated with accessory pathway or active foci, we use this RV ablation, RF ablation. And a general consensus is to ensure that RF ablation cluster electrode is placed as far as possible away at least five centimeter from the device or from the leads. Uh, what about the tense used for analgesia? Theoretically, it may cause pacemaker inhibition. It can be used safely in patients with bipolar pacemaker and AICDs. Use in close proximity to the device is not advised. So this, keep it away from the device. This is the most safest uh, uh, procedure. Uh, what about the electroconvulsive therapy? Little current will pass through the heart. So it is not from the, the issue is not from the current itself. Seizures may cause inappropriate activation to the muscle contractility and the seizure is the important thing. This may cause AICD uh, activation or rate act adaptive feature of the pacemaker and the other features may left intact. So in patients with in inactivated AICD, be prepared for external defibrillation if VT tag or VF occurs. So should AICD should be disabled and we should be ready with VT, uh, VT tag VF uh, defibrillation equipment. For the lysotripsy, so, and the pacemaker. Pacemaker circuit damage may occur. Focal point of beam should be away and the contraindicated in patients with the electric circuit in the abdomen. And it is best advisable, uh, uh, best to disable the tach tachycardia detection of ICD during the as well and to test it following the procedure. So just disable before the procedure, test it after the procedure. And you should be a dedicated pacemaker programmer available if we need. What about the radiation therapy to avoid potential failure and runaway pacemaker, which is a pacemaker which is overshooting in its rate, generator device should be outside the field of radiation. So for these patients, sometimes surgical reloca relocation of the device may be advised. MRI is very important. Lead electrode heating and tissue damage can occur. Device heating and tissue damage and the implanted pocket damage. Induce the currents on leads resulting in continuous capture, VTAC, VF, hemodynamic collapse, damage to the device or leads causing the system to fail, damage to the functionality and the mechanical integrity, movement or vibration of the device and leads, competitive pacing and the potential for VTAC, VF induction uh, uh, from the MRI. So multiple uh, things can happen. Traditionally, the presence of CIED was a contraindication for MRI. Until recently, where there is an MRI conditional device, is now the device itself should be MRI conditional, and the leads also need to be designed for using M MRI. Consultation with MRI technologist is important, cardiac pacemaker technologist, and the cardiologist. Put it on the MRI mode if it is possible, and we can pre program the old pacemakers to the 000 mode. So 
disable them if the patient has good underlying rhythm and adequate monitoring and resuscitation equipment should be available with extended defibrillator, but outside the scanning room. This is very important. And this is uh, an implanted P uh, pacemaker and ICD management with MRI, and we can revise this with the, it is the same, but it is in a flow chart in the European guidelines. What about the magnet and the pacemaker? Uh, the magnet activates what's called the magnetic read switch in the pacemaker. And this is model de dependent behavior with the magnet, so it's not always the same. We can see here a patient with a, 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 vent a ventricular uh, arrhythmia at a very high rate. And we can see here the, these patients with VTAC. And we can see all spikes before all the complexes. So this is a pacemaker induced or mediated tachycardia. And we can find this. This is the magnet. This thing, it's always present here in the uh, uh, attached to the or attracted to the uh, crash card, which is present in the emergency department. So this is usually in the emergency departments uh, 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 in the hospitals. And this is the uh, rhythm that we saw before. And this is after application of the magnet here. And the rhythm is now back to 78 beats per minute. Uh, this is the magnetic read switch and it flips when we put the magnet on the uh, pacemaker. This is spontaneous complexes without the magnet, and this is with the magnet applied to them. And this is always, now it is uh, uh, VOO. Uh, behavior of the magnet, unpredictable. May cause asynchronous spacing, no apparent rate of rhythmic change, brief asynchronous spacing, and return to the previous one, continuous or transient loss of pacing, so unpredictable. And intraoperative monitoring should be always in this patient with continuous ECG, signs of peripheral perfusion, and invasive monitoring because this is a cardiac patient that we said, cardiac status, type of surgery, and pacemaker failure detection. Anesthetic technique for patients with the AIC, with the CIEDs, tailored to cardiovascular disease. So whatever, however the patient is and whatever the cardiac condition, we tailor the anesthetic to this cardiac condition. Anesthetics and the pacing threshold and the how is affected and the, the use of succinyl choline and the pacemaker. Electrocautery and the pacemaker, we already discussed this and we discussed the defibrillation and this is the position of the pads as advised. So this is one of the, on the back and one of the on, uh, uh, front and this is, is the can is on this side if it is on this side and this is another one if the can is on this side and this we can use these pads on the different position um, what about the EICD and the anesthesia uh, EICD has both pacing and choking function so precautions are similar to pacemaker and the very important thing deactivate cardioversion and defibrillation function of EICD if you suspect any uh, electromagnetic interference but don't forget to reactivate after the end of surgery. Please deactivate before, reactivate after the end of surgery. Magnet as and the ICD, uh, uh, we discussed this as well. Uh, um, so what are the impact of the anesthetic drugs? Anesthetic drugs do not alter stimulation threshold of atrial pacemakers. We avoid nitrous oxide in patients with newly implanted pacemakers for air in the pocket and dysfunction of the uh, device. Avoid hyperventilation, alkalosis may cause uh, hypokalemia. And what are the factors that alter the threshold? These are the hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, arterial hypoxemia, myocardial infarction, and the catecholamine excess. And so look at these points. This can alter the threshold. Saxonylcholine, it is transient effect, and it is due to alteration in the, in the a contraction of the skeletal muscles, which could inhibit the pacemaker. It may interfere with the potassium level, but this is not to a very important level, except the patient itself have altered the potassium level. But clinical experience suggests that this is always a transient effect if the patient is previously not hyper or hypokalemic. Uh, transcutaneous cardiac patient is always present. We should use this transcutaneous pacing with the areas of lesser muscle mass to be effective, and uh, we should use a, a temporizing measure until trans. So this is temporary until we uh, uh, can get a transvenous cardiac pacing uh, for these patients. What's about pacemaker failure? So if there is a pacemaker failure, should recognize, assess hemodynamic status, identify the cause, and manage. 
Pacemaker failure, blood pressure stable, observe oxygen and you may give atopy. Hypotension, dopamine, adrenaline, isoprenaline, temporary pacing. Assistory, start the CPR. So what causes the failure? Failure to pace, failure to capture under sensing, over sensing. This is failure to pace, for example, there is no pacing. This is failure to capture. So there is the spontaneous rates, but this pacemaker is not causing anything. And under sensing, so it is not sensing the patient's contraction. So it is giving all the time its uh, stimulation. And this is very uh, dangerous. And factors which increasing the pacemaker threshold, as we did before, are myocardial ischemia, electrolyte disturbance, acidosis, alkalosis, hypoxia, hypercapnia, and abnormal antiarrhythmic drug level, especially class one and the beta blockers. What about the post-operative care? Monitor the patient, interrogate the device again, reprogram. Don't forget to reprogram the devices. So this is the answers for the questions that we started with. If we recall the uh, answers, so the first one is false, the second false, third false, and the last one is true. And the second set of questions, false, false, true, false. If you can go back to the questions and the answers and uh, I think you will, after uh, uh, this, you can uh, uh, find the relation between the uh, answers and the questions. Uh, this is very important. I advise all of you to have a look at the practice advisory for the operative management of patients with cardiac implantable electronic devices, pacemakers, and the implantable cardioverter defibrillators 2020. It's published in the anesthesiology 2020. And uh, uh, the summary at the end, there is a flow chart that you can go through. This is, we all, we, we, we said all of this previously, discussed it, but this is as a summary. You can go and revise this summary. You can print these two papers, put you, put them always in front of your eyes. This is the management during the perioperative period. This is the interoperative management. And this is the emergency def defibrillation cardioversion in each case and the post-operative management as well. And this is very important. We, uh, 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 said that we are going to have a look at some uh, chest X-ray. This one is one of the X-ray. This is the generator here, uh, and you cannot differentiate the, the uh, AICD from the pacemaker from the generator. So this is false. One of the, the answers of the questions that we uh, mentioned before. It's only you can uh, differentiate from the presence of a coil. If there is a presence of a coil or not, there is here. There is no coil. There is no thickened part, and this is. A single chamber, so this is only single wire coming from the head here, single, 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 and going to the RV, so sing, single chamber uh, uh, pacemaker. We can see here two wires, one of them ending in the right atrium, the other one in the right ventricle, so this is dual chamber uh, pacemaker. Uh, uh, another one here, this is in the atrium, and this is in the ventricle, and this is dual chamber uh, pacemaker as well. Uh, for this uh, uh, one, we can find here uh, uh, the coil. Which we, we said this, this coil in the SBC and this coil in the right ventricle, okay? And this wire is in the right atrium. So this is a AICD, AICD, atrial, ventricular, and two coils. So what about this thing? This is the uh, VAD or ventricular assist device in this patient, uh, as we can see uh, uh, in this X-ray. Uh, so what about this X-ray? The generator is here, the coil is here, and this is another coil. This is a right atrial lead, and this is a right ventricular lead, and this is another lead which is going through the right atrium, coronary sinus, and the crossing to the LV. So this is an LV coronary sinus lead. So we are here are pacing the atria and both ventricles. So this is synchronized uh, pacing or CRT or cardiac resynchronization therapy, as we mentioned before. This is very important. Another one here, in a patient with a mitral valve clipping operation, we can find a right atria lead and a right ventricular uh, lead, which is an ICD lead because it is thick. And another lead here, which is a posterior LV lead that is present. This lead is not through the coronary sinus. It is it's not sorry, through to the lateral, to the anterior wall of the left ventricle. This is to the uh, lateral or posterior walls. Uh, uh, and this is an LV lead, which is not uh, uh, going to the uh, anterior wall of the left ventricle. Um, this is another one with a right atrial lead and 
um, and uh, right, this is one is the ventricular septal lead, and it has got two left ventricular leads, one in the anterior ventricular wall, and the other one in the in the uh, lateral uh, um, uh, wall. So this has got two left ventricular leads, one right ventricular uh, lead and one atrial lead. So this is CRT as well. When we see CRT, this is synchronized. Uh, 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 cardiac resynchronization therapy, and if it is CRTD, so this we add the letter D, which means defibrillation. So this is synchronized uh, therapy of the heart with defibrillation. At that point, we call it CRTD, uh, and this is a very nice X-ray showing the S. This is the SVC coil, and this is the RVC coil. Here, RV coil, right atrial lead, left ventricle and right ventricle, and this is the different parts or components of the device. Uh, this X-ray is a very nice one. This is a lead fracture, which caused the failure uh, for, of pacing, and this is well. This is a, 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 a fracture here as well in the coil, so this is uh, can cause a failure in the uh, defibrillation function. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Amr. I really enjoyed uh, this very informative uh, lecture. Uh, it opens a lot of discussion, I think. Uh, but I have one question from the one of the attendees. How can the diathermy affect the pacemaker or electromagnetic interference affect the, the uh, the uh, pacemaker or CIED. I think you, you mentioned or you explained it very clearly. Diathermy. Anything, anything can happen. Yeah. Anything can happen. Yeah. Anything Diath can happen. Diathermy mm. can cause any any malfunction of the pacemaker or the AICD. It is very okay. dangerous, uh, especially the unipolar one. Okay. I will. Uh, I will. Uh, speak with you about some points Keda, if it, it will be of uh, interest for all of us. Uh, yeah, what sure. about the CPR for yes. a patient uh, and uh, we'll give him a, cardio, uh, a shock. We'll give the same shock, the same intensity of the shock, joules, or we'll reduce the shock or what, what do you think? The in, the, in, the, in the guidelines that I showed you in the 2020 thing, it gives the usual shock. Yeah. Okay. So you give the usual shock that you used to. If it is not working, we can go up higher on the uh, shock, uh, which is always the same, even without a, 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 piece, a device. So you, you, you give always the uh, same shock as used without a device. I think every, every anesthetist has, has to ask himself four questions you mentioned already. Uh, the third one is the base maker, it is a, Best maker dependent or no? This is the most important. Yeah. Being dependent is some another way of management. Yeah. Uh, being in uh, uh, independent, All right? One one important thing uh, that uh, uh, you you should attend, uh, if possible, the electrophysiology examination or the cardiology interrogation of the pacemaker, because at that point you can see the effect that they are inducing on the pacemaker, on the, your ECG, on your arterial wave, and you can decide is this with him if this patient is dependent or not. And if he is dependent, what mode and rate you would choose for this patient to complete the surgery? So it is not only about is it dependent or not. So what are we going to do? Are we going to put him on a fixed mode, for example, and what rate uh, for, we, we should go for this patient. And if he has some intrinsic activity, should we leave it or not? Should we put a backup? For example, if this patient has a heart rate, has a, an intrinsic rate of 60 to 70, and you can accept this. If this it is type, like uh, 60 or 70, he will not be a pacemaker dependent, right? Yes, yes but you should, huh? at that point, you should, put, you, you should put a backup for this patient. Yeah, sure. Huh? And if he is a cardiac patient, uh, with, with a regurg lesion, for example, and he needs a higher heart rate, 
you shouldn't accept the 60 or 70. Uh, yeah. should, so uh, what do you think about what is, uh, let us uh, yeah, and clarify to the attendees, what is the mean to buy definition of pacemaker dependent? What does it mean? Pacemaker dependent, as we said, if we put this patient on a V, VI mode on the lowest possible rate, it, the heart will not take over. So it may endanger his life. He cannot, yeah. he yeah. cannot, yeah. Yeah. yeah, he must be paced for sustaining sustain his life. His yes. This is very important, the point yes. to be clear for others, for the, for the other. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What, what if, suppose you have an emergency, uh, intra-abdominal surgery, emergency at night, uh, there is no consultant, no cardiac consultation. You don't have anything, patient with uh, ICD, uh, there is electromagnetic interference that will occur. How you will manage this situation if you are uh, in, 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 I will say, in a place where you are not have everything available for you? It, 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 it happened. Oh, it, yeah. oh, it's happening. What do if you think? You what's your recommendation for such condition? If you don't, first of all, speak with the patient and if you can have any history from him, because the history may tell you if this patient is dependent on the pacemaker or not. Uh, second of all, you the examination and the ECG, pull look at the ECG, look at the uh, examination, look at the chest X-ray and you can see and know what type of device is this for the right. patient. Right. Third of all, you can, if you don't have the facilities of the electrophysiology, you can do the Valsalva, you can do the carotid massage and say if this patient will respond or not. And if you have the magnet, which is sometimes present, you can use the magnet. If not, you can just assume that this patient is dependent on the pacemaker and take all the precautions that you can. And if this patient is emergency surgery, so just all the emergency drugs should be present, external a defibrillation pads should be put on the patient and uh, in, uh, uh, interrogate and investigate the room. How about the electromagnetic interference? And uh, okay. give, give uh, clear instructions about the placement of the pads and put it yourself, the pads and the how the direction of the current and as far as we can from the uh, pacemaker. And if we can instruct the surgeons to give minimal bursts and with lowest current as well. This will be right. very important. And always keep an eye with invasive monitoring of the patient, invasive monitoring, invasive cardiac monitoring for this patient is mandatory at that point. If you want to, even, even in patients which we pre-program the pacemakers to the v, VOO, for example, or DOO or whatever, even with this, the, end, the, the, the EMI may interfere still with the yeah. pacemaker right. and you okay. may need to uh, uh, do something. The very important thing that I didn't mention, uh, if this patient has an AICD in place and this AICD uh, is deactivated before surgery and this patient now is uh, 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 in VF or VTAC, what should we do at that point? Mm -hmm. So the first of all, if you have an EP uh, electrophysiologist in nearby, you can call him to reactivate it. And uh, this can be, if it is done properly and if it is done very rapidly, it is, it can, you can wait for 15 seconds. If it, yes. there is no shock delivered, you at that point deliver external defibrillation. So okay. don't rush to the external defibrillation from your side if you have an AICD which is deactivated, call the EP if, he, if he's nearby coming, trying to reactivate, 15 seconds, okay, okay. Right. If it's not okay, external defibrillation. Thank you very much. Uh, but another uh, last, last uh, point, uh, yeah. is, there, uh, is there a change between the response to magnet with the pacemaker patient and the ICD patient? Yes. The response to magnet? Can you yes, in response to the point? magnet, uh, uh, the response with uh, of the AICD to the magnet is usually the deactivation of the anti tachycardia and the anti uh, and the and the shocking uh, uh, mechanism of the of the AICD. 
which is different. But, from... but, but about, what about the, the, the bradycardia or the pacemaker activity? It's usually does not it affected. The patient? Yes, it's it does... usually not affected. Okay, usually it's not very affected. important point yeah. about the difference between both. Thank you very much, Dr. Amr. I really enjoyed the lecture. Very happy no, about, to hear from you. Thank you very much. Uh, any question from uh, anyone? Thank you very much. See you. Shukran, Dr. Am. Thank now you. We'll, uh, no, no, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll shift to the second lecture, which is an intensive care lecture about the stroke in the intensive care unit uh, by Prof. Dr. Uh, Amr Safwat. We have to, to, uh, tonight uh, doc, both Dr. <laughs> Amr. As usual. Dr. Amr Safwat is uh, graduated from Ain Shams Hospital 1994, and uh, he got his master's degree and mid, uh, doctor degree, and uh, then traveled to Saudi Arabia as the head of uh, head of uh, department in, in GMP hospital in Abha, and lastly he went to Maladive as a head of department in the top hospital in the Maladive. Welcome, Doctor Amr, and uh, we hope to enjoy your lecture. Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure to be introduced by uh, Dr. Mohammed Ibrahim. Thank you. And I think it's um, a very difficult task to give a presentation following the presentation of Dr. Amr, which is very informative and very uh, full of pearls, as, as we say. So if we can start talking about our issue today. <clears throat> we will be sorry for the talking about acute stroke in the ICU. So, acute ischemic stroke will start first. Acute ischemic stroke is characterized by the sudden loss of blood circulation to an area in the brain particularly in vascular territory resulting in a corresponding loss of neurological function. Approximately <clears throat> 10 to 15, 15 to 20% of acute ischemic stroke patients are admitted to the ICU. Admitting this patient in a specialized stroke unit will give better results for the outcome of the stroke. This is a diagrammatic representation of the circle of Willis, which is the brain blood supply. This is usually being asked in the question like MCQ, like oral questions. So I hope that anyone preparing for an exam in the intensive care or critical care to be ready to answer like these questions. How to assess a patient with acute ischemic stroke? First of all, we have to take full medical history from the patient to decide if this is really a stroke, to determine if the patient is still in the window period, to avoid potential complications of acute therapy. Then we have to make proper physical examination we should assess the level of consciousness, cranial nerves, we have to check the pupils, the visual fields, eye movements, and facial muscles. Higher cortical, cortical centers, we should check the aphasia and the neglect phenomena. Limb power and ataxia, sensory examination, and reflexes, biceps, triceps, ankle, and the skin. There are some emergency diagnostic tests that we have to or blood glucose level, full blood count, renal function test, cardiac biomarkers, coagulation profile, ECG. Then we will go for neuroimaging, we make the non-contrast CT brain, which is the mostly common, most commonly used until now, CT and geography. MR, MRI brain can be done, but it's more with subacute infarctions and Doppler study of the neck. The National Institute of Health Stroke Scale. This is a scale done by the National Institute of Health in the USA. This examination can be performed rapidly and can be easily assessed and give reliable results. 
they assess the level of consciousness, the uh, extraocular muscles, visual fields, facial muscles, right and left arm, uh, right and left uh, lower limbs, limb ataxia, sensations, uh, language and aphasia, dysarthria, and any other abnormalities. So if our score is zero, there is no stroke. Score one to four, there's minus stroke. Score five to 15, moderate stroke. Stroke 15 to 20, moderate to severe stroke. 21 to 24, severe devastating stroke. So usually the thrombolysis is recommended score between 21 and uh, between more than five to 25, less than 25. There is some guidelines for the goal time goals for evaluation and management of acute stroke patients put by the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke in the United States as door to physician time 10 minutes or less door to stroke team 15 minutes door to CT 25 minutes door to CT interpretation 45 minutes door to medication 60 minutes, and door to stroke unit admission, three hours. As we say in the acute myocardial infarction that time is muscles, here time is nerves. Deal accurately, deal fast with your patient, and do not delay your management for any reason. What's the early management that we will do to the patient in the ER on admission? control the ABC. We have indications for intracranial intubation if we have low blast coma scale, if we have severe respiratory depression or of loss of airway protective reflexes, we have to intubate the patient to protect his airway and to, to maintain his respiration. Control of blood pressure is very important. First measures to be done for the patient. The current guidelines recommend permissive hypertension for those patients who do not receive thrombolysis. Antihypertensive treatment should be withheld if the blood pressure is less, sorry, less than 220 and 120, and less than 185 over 100 for thrombolysis patients. So don't be aggressive in treatment of blood pressure in chronically hypertensive patients which can reduce cerebral blood flow and worsen the condition. <clears throat> Glycemic management, our target blood glucose level during endovascular therapy during the, is 140 over 80, is from 80 to 140 milligram per deciliter. And the target in the ICU should be less than 180 milligram per deciliter. Avoid severe fluctuation in blood glucose hyper or hypoglycemia are having very bad results to stroke patients. We have to avoid or give prophylax against seizures, which can happen in one to 4% of all cases, and usually caused by large cortical infarctions. Temperature, we have target temperature of 37.5. We have to treat any source of infection because patient with high fever, high temperature, and stroke patients have higher mortality rates. <clears throat> what is the differential diagnosis of acute ischemic stroke? Number one, intracranial hemorrhage, where the onset is usually during a hypertensive crisis. Symptoms progress within minutes, and there's an acute onset of headache and early loss of consciousness during the intracranial hemorrhage. Second differential diagnosis is hypoglycemia, drug toxicity, intracranial space occupying lesion, encephalitis, and metabolic disorders. How to localize the stroke clinically? Stroke can be many types, like lacunary infarctions, which are usually preceded by PIA a few minutes before the stroke, 
It has insidious onset and progressive course. Systemic embolization is usually associated with history of cardiac problems. It has sudden onset with maximum severity. At the onset time, can be large artery thrombosis embolism like middle cerebral artery infarction, MCA. It shows contralateral motor weakness and or sensory loss where the face and arm are affected more than the leg. And aphasia will happen if the dominant hemisphere is affected and there's conjugated ipsilateral eye deviation. This is a, is a picture of a big middle cerebral artery occlusion with stroke, massive stroke. Anterior cerebral artery infarction, we have contralateral hemiparesis and or sensory loss. Here, the lower limb is more than the upper limb with urinary incontinence. If a posterior circulation infarction, which is the vertebral, basilar, or posterior cerebral artery, we will see epsilateral cranial nerve palsy, contralateral motor and or sensory loss, cerebellar dysfunction, Horner syndrome, and behavior dis uh, disturbance. <clears throat> what is, is the general management of acute ischemic stroke in the ICU? We have to fully monitor the respiration with possible intubation and ventilation, blood pressure and uh, manage according to the targets. Cardiac monitoring, we'll, have, we'll do an ECG, do biomarkers, echo if needed. Temperature, keep it below 37.5, blood glucose, as we said, below 180. Seizures, we can use EEG for monitoring and aggressive treatment of, of documented convulsions. The neuromonitoring, we will need regular neurological examination. CT brain should be repeated 24 to 48 hours after, while routine ICP monitoring is not recommended except in selected cases. Treatment of Acute ischemic stroke will start with the reperfusion therapy. Thrombolysis happens with patient with moderate to severe deficit or worse. IV recombinant uh, tissue plasmation activator should be considered for the patients in the winter period of 4.5 hours after the onset of symptoms. The dose is 0 0.9 milligram per kilogram, but don't exceed 90 mg. 10% of the dose should be given as bolus in one minute to be followed by 90% of the dose as infusion over one hour. Patients after TPA should not receive antiplatelets or anticoagulation for 24 hours. The endovascular treatment, patient with large proximal cerebral artery occlusion who present shortly after symptoms onset, onset within a six hour window should be considered for endovascular treatment, which will show good outcome. The indication and contraindications of thrombolytic therapy are very clear. Please, we have to follow them properly and strictly because not following this Contraindications can lead to devastating results. The contraindications like severe hypertension, like su suggestion of any hemorrhage or um, in the brain or anywhere in the, in, in, in the body, like upper GIT or renal tract hemorrhage within the previous two or three weeks any active bleeding as acute traumatic fracture on examination, any, any bleeding disorder will, will give us a contraindication to not to proceed for the thrombolytic therapy. Which patient should be admitted to the ICU of stroke patients? If patient is intubated, ventilated, patient with impaired level of consciousness or any sign of brainstem dysfunction, patient with elevated ICP with cerebral edema, patient in states epilepticus, patient with massive stroke score with 
more than 17. Patients with large MCA infarction, medial cerebral artery infarction, uncontrolled blood pressure for invasive monitoring to be admitted in the ICU, for organ support like patient with acute renal failure or patient with cardiac failure, for post-operative admission after decompression craniotomy, all these patients are the candidates for ICU admission. In the ICU, head, head of the patient in the midline and elevated 20 to 30 degrees. Avoid head rotation so as not to influence the venous return. And if sedation is needed, must be adequate to avoid sudden increase in ICP. Avoid, avoid big hemodynamic changes during intubation. And fluid balance should be carefully monitored to maintain eovolemia. Plus, of course, the general me measures for care of comatose patient, eye care, mouth care, skin care, uh, anti-stress measures, and stress ulcer measures, anti-thromboembolic measures like this. If we go to the second type of cases that we can meet, intracerebral hemorrhage. What are the causes of non-traumatic intracerebral hemorrhage? Chronic hypertension, vascular malformations, long use of anticoagulants, brain tumors, hemorrhagic conversion of ischemic area, bleeding disorders, liver diseases, CNS infections, and vasculites. Management of intracranial hemorrhage, we have to go for imaging, non-contrast CT, can define the size, location, in, and interventricular extension, and the shift of the midline. We can go for CT and geography if needed. Serial CT scan should be done to determine the extent of the hematoma and to guide the treatment. The treatment of ICT can be very difficult in the presence of coagulopathy, so coagulopathy should be treated. We can use prothrombin uh, complex concentrate or fresh frozen plasma according to the facilities in the institute that we are working in and cautious and slow blood pressure reduction is advised. Don't give strong measures to drop the blood pressure suddenly because it will lead to very poor outcome if it happens. The surgical intervention in patients with spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage are still controversial, but they said that small clots, brainstem hematoma, patients above 70 years of age, patients with low glaucoma scale are best managed conservatively. But <clears throat> cerebellar hematomas with mass effect and lobar hematomas with neurological deterioration should be surgically removed as soon as possible. Subarachinoid hemorrhage, this is the third kind of neurological patient that we can meet in our ICU. Subarachinoid hemorrhage is a neurological emergency with high mortality and morbidity. It accounts to, uh, for three to 6% of strokes as a whole. The one month fertility rate is around 30%. And for those who survive, one third of them will need long, lifelong care. 80% of subarachinoid hemorrhage is due to spontaneous rupture of aneurysm in the basal arteries. In severe cases, the ICP may rise to very high levels, approaching or even above the mean arterial blood pressure. Global cerebral edema will causing widespread ischemic neurological injury may ensue and causes very poor outcome for patients with subarachinoid hemorrhage. This is a CT picture of subarachinoid hemorrhage. Normal ICP is 50, 5 to 15 millimeter mercury. If it is, sorry, it's 5 to 15 millimeters mercury. If it mild increase 16 to 20, moderate increase 21 to 30, with severe increase if above 30 millimeter mercury. 
Cerebral perfusion pressure equals mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure, normally 70 to 100. If less than 50, it will cause neurological damage. Can you take a picture of subarachnoid hemorrhage? It's severe intolerable headache, where the patients usually give this expression that this is the worst feeling he had in his whole, whole life. There is neck rigidity, there is vomiting, there is seizures, there is altered consciousness. We have the investigation of choice is again the non contrast CT scan. Uh, but, but a normal scan, particularly early, does not exclude the diagnosis. So, in the presence of a typical history, a normal scan, lumbar puncture should be done. The presence of RBCs or their metabolites in the CSF is diagnostic of subarachnoid hemorrhage. <clears throat> what are the treatment goals of subarachnoid hemorrhage? Number one, maintain ABC, maintain cerebral perfusion, and minimize the risk of rebleeding and vasospasm. Rebleeding is prevented by aneurysm obliteration. is the most important method of preventing rebleeding -ble re either surgically or radiologically. Keep systolic pressure below 160. Avoid the use of nitrates as a method of control of blood pressure. We can use because it can cause increased intracranial pressure. We can use the betalol or hydrolazine as other options. Cerebral vasospasm, delayed ischemic deficit from vasospasm is, the, is a major cause of morbidity and mortality in subarachnoid hemorrhage. Postoperatively, blood pressure may be allowed to rise to a higher level to decrease the possibility of vasospasm. How to diagnose that there is a cerebral vasospasm post subarachnoid hemorrhage? Clinically, there will be reduction in the level of consciousness or new neurological deficit. Radiologically, we can diagnose it by angiography. Also, transcranial Doppler can be used in the evaluation of vasospasm. How to treat this vasospasm? The mainstay of treatment of vasospasm is induced hypertension. Volume expansion by relatively high saline intake from three to five liters per day. But the effectiveness of this hypertensive hypervolemia is still debated in some centers. So, volemia is associated with high rates of cerebral ischemia. And if vasopressors are needed, we can use phenylephrine, dopamine, vasopressin, or norepinephrine. Control of seizures to prevent re-bleeding of the unsecured aneurysm. Thank you so much. This is a very brief presentation of the strokes. Here you have two pictures of the first hospital I ever worked in and the last hospital I worked in with 29 years different. Thank you so much. Hope it was a very light lecture and see you soon. Thank you very, uh, doctor, very much, Dr. Amr. It is very concise, as I said. Uh, I have a question. There's one question about uh, the uh, score for stroke. How it is calculated? Again, please. Again, please. It is the... Uh, we have uh, multiple criteria, level of consciousness, uh, the extraocular muscle movement, mm -hmm. visual field, the facial policy and muscles, the right and left are motor deficit, right and left uh, leg motor deficit, limb ataxia, sensations, mm -hmm. language and aphasia, and dysarthria. This, each one of them, it's very big score. I, if I can share it with everyone okay. later on. 
Yes. But uh, and it's it each point has uh, sub points and uh, score. Uh, at the end, it's calculated and give, giving us the number of. Uh, okay. I, I want to ask a question about uh, the mechanical ventilation. How yes, the mechanical sir. ventilation between these types of stroke is different? In a patient with ischemic stroke, for example, a patient subarachnoid hemorrhage, intracranial hemorrhage, the, those who are working at the intensivist, how they manage this about regarding the CO2, regarding uh, the PEEP level, whatever, what do you think about this? Does it differ? Uh, first of all, we, we try to avoid high PEEP in uh, neurological injury or patient with suspected increase in blood pressure because high PEEP can contribute to the elevation of intracranial pressure. Okay. So we are trying to make it as small as possible. Second point about the CO2, of course, the hyper capnia or hypocapnia issue that to keep the patient in a state of normal capnia going less to the lower limit, but avoid decrease of the uh, carbon dioxide less than 30 to avoid cerebral vasospasm. That is that what you meant, sir? Oh, okay, there another question, Dr. Amra, is the nemodobin has a place in the management of cerebral vasospasm? In a patient with cerebral hemorrhage? It's yes, it's it has been used. And uh, it's it has been it's has been used for a long time, but there is no very accurate stud, uh, supporting uh, evidence about this. Oh. Okay, another question. Uh, what are the methods accepted to induce hypertension? As we said before, there is the uh, hyper volumic hypertension method, which is giving big uh, volume of saline every day, three to five liters. And also the, uh, if needed, we can use some vasopressors, as we said before. Okay, uh, another, another point uh, regarding the ICP. The nor this normal value of the ICP is while the patient is uh, subine or the lateral position or semi-setting, this 5 to 15. Uh, so, supine. So, uh, 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 supine. So uh, this patient usually will put them in, in uh, semi-setting position or 30 degree. Uh, yes. Right? So this, yes. So this uh, when, uh, where, where exactly we measure the ICP, we can... It is from the uh, ventriculostomy or from uh, a lumbar site? What do you think? No, from the, from the ventricles. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to open uh, a way of discussion because <laughs> there are some uh, uh, genres I know that they are uh, here and this uh, uh, very important. Though. So from the ventriculostomy, do yes, you adjust, adjust the position regarding whether the patient is in sitting or, sin or uh, supine? Yes, of course, we adjust the, 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 the level of measuring yes. going to the position of the patient. Usually keep these patients between 20 and 30 degrees yeah. uh, head up position. And right. accordingly, we will uh, adjust the level of the zero level of the of our ah, measurement. So the zero level will differ, it will differ from uh, yes. while the patient, yes, right? Yes, sir. Okay. I think Dr. Amr Hashim has a question. Can you please, uh, Dr. Amr? Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Amr, for this very informative uh, uh, lecture. Is, uh, uh, first question is, what's the role of the MRI? If this patient, when uh, uh, should the patient go for an MRI before uh, from politic therapy or before uh, cardiac for before intervention in the vascular uh, uh, etiology, and uh, um, if I mean if the patient is stable enough to go, uh, should he go to the MRI and is it present in the guidelines at, at, at any point? And is the second question is the window of four point five hours still four point five or, or has it been extended or is there any um, 
do they strictly 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 follow the 4.5 hours or there is any deviation from this so about the 4.5 hours until now in most of the centers it's been followed mm. some centers now are discussing increasing it to six hours yeah and especially if you are planning for endovascular treatment okay about Thank the uh, MRI uh, question, until now, the most important tool is the CT. Yes, if the patient is stable enough, we can proceed for MRI, but the MRI has some drawbacks, like the length of yeah, sure. length of the time of the, of the procedure. The, yes. and, and many times we are being called to the MRI suite to anesthetize the patients. So these patients, you want, <laughs> who will be like, <laughs> enjoying the anesthesia of this patient? <laughs> I know, I know uh, it's this. always like uh, 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 avoid doing MRIs for these patients, yes. especially from our side, we don't like it. Yes. But sometimes uh, yes. the, 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 the neurologist will ask for it if the patient is stable. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Amr. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Dr. Amr, another comment or another question. Uh, is there a role for colloid fluids instead of crystalloid in such patients? I don't think so, no. Uh, it, it was never mentioned in the guidelines. And then usually we don't use colloid for head injury or for uh, mm. increased intracranial tension. Even... Now, in, in, all, in all our work in INSEs and ICU, we're, we're going not too much for colloids. Okay. About, what about the dexamethasone and mannitol? Still, uh, they have a role in, uh, in a stroke patient? Dexamethasone, definitely no. Okay. Mannitol, it has a role only if there is brain edema, which at that time, we're not usually seeing it in stroke patients except in a very late stages or very uh, massive strokes. Okay, thank you. I think Dr. Thanks, Walid sir. will have uh, a comment. Can you please, Dr. Walid? Uh, so thanks very much for this uh, very comprehensive lecture as usual, Dr. Amr Safat. Thank uh, you, sir. It, 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 it's just a few ideas depending on my, like my work in here in Ireland. Uh, you may disagree with me completely. So I, we had a few questions about crystalloids versus colloids. The colloids is not something homogenous, so we can differentiate that into starch-based colloids and yes. gelofusine-based colloids. So starch is known with its contraindication in all high ICPs, so it's completely contraindicated. One of the yes. main contraindications by the FDA, so don't, if it's traumatic brain injury or any high ICP is one of contraindications to use a starch. Uh, but while gelofuzine, I had seen it used in a lot of uh, neurocenters here in Ireland, so I, but I don't know if there's any evidence against that one, if you agree with me. Uh, the second point, uh, like I, all, I will say all my point and then give you the mic to answer all of them. Uh, the second point is there is a question about uh, the treatment on how to induce hypertension. So the old treatment for uh, high ICP or subarachnoid hemorrhage causing high ICP is the triple H therapy, which is hemodilution, hypertension, and uh, uh, hypervolemia is, yes. is not of any evidence now. So it's yes. only the hypertension is the only evidence-based practice. And yes. what is the degree of hypertension? What is the target map? This is a big dilemma. Uh, that's to my knowledge. <clears throat> um, so how to uh, use... What, what to use to induce the hypertension? Is it noradrenaline? You need to put a central line and the neck manipulation and the central line position. Use it femoral or internal jugular. All this is like, I think it's dilemmas which were never uh, evidence-based practice uh, or uh, there's no ev enough evidence. And if I have any question here, uh, Dr. Amr Safwat, is what is the role of ultrasound? You know, I'm an ultrasound man. Uh, what is the role of ultrasound? Uh, and the last comment before I finish this talk is uh, we need to differentiate between the subarachnoid hemorrhage of medical etiology or a bleeding aneurysm mm -hmm. versus uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage from traumatic, traumatic. brain injury. Of course. So uh, there, is no, there is no rule for pneumodipine at all uh, for subarachnoid hemorrhage of traumatic brain injury origin. Yes. And, and that's a completely different kettle of fish if we compare that to an aneurysmal bleeding. This is the one we 
are required by all evidence to start nemodipine. And if the, even if the patient is hypotensive, uh, you can use uh, uh, nemodipine two hourly or nemodipine infusion or whatever, but you have to have to use the nemodipine in any way, but you have to have the nemodipine. So it's one uh, or another, so it's completely different. Just to clarify that for the juniors colleague. Uh, so I'll come back to my question. What do you think about using ultrasound? Does ultrasound have any role in uh, stroke patients? The best person to, uh, to answer this question is you. So <laughs> <laughs> kindly I, I, proceed. <laughs> I, I, I agree with you, uh, Dr. Am. And, uh, I think Dr. Walid, uh, yeah, you open uh, uh, an area. Uh, yes. You can give us what is, uh, what is uh, you, yeah, new guidelines about this or the use of uh, ultrasound in such situation. Yeah, Dr. Walid, you, yeah, you okay, can give so, us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I just go uh, quickly through them. Uh, like if we're talking about a patient with ICP and impending herniation, optic nerve sheath diameter is, is a good tool yes. to follow up instead of taking the patient to CT every couple of hours. Uh, yes. So it's, 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 it's sensitivity and specificity is not that bad. It's, it's a good one, actually. Uh, and uh, if we're talking about subarachnoid hemorrhage and cerebral vasospasm, uh, there's a very good rule of... Uh, uh, transcranial ultrasound and uh, Doppler on the uh, middle cerebral artery. And we call that a lint guard ratio if we compare the speed or the velocity of blood yes. in the middle cerebral artery and compare that to in the internal carotid artery. If you have a good baseline on the patient, you can trace that. And if this ratio changes after 24 or 48 hours, this is an indication that the middle cerebral artery has a vasospasm. So you can increase your nomidipine or you can start hydration of the patient or do something to prevent the spasm. And if uh, you wanna go for CT, this will be like increase uh, the pre-test uh, sensitivity and specificity. So it's a good tool again uh, to use this one. Uh, the velocity, will, uh, velocity more than 200 centimeter per, per second yeah. or uh, is the... I think cut off for cerebral yes. Spasm. yes yes so but you, you can you need to use that is uh, as a lint guard ratio because sometimes the high speed is coming from the carotid if the patient himself is hypertensive problems yes so we still need to differentiate and you the best thing is to have like a baseline i'm sorry for my interruption uh, and it's just no, my no, thoughts no, of course, i no, wanted to that, share with our junior thank you very thank you very much dr ali still we have some questions dr amr uh, from uh, our colleagues is there any difference between the hypertonic saline and manitol in the management uh, management of stroke related brain edema? Uh, some okay. centers, some yeah. centers now are, are recommending the use of hypertonic saline more than the uh, manitol. Oh, so yeah, so uh, each one has his advantage and disadvantage, yes. right? Okay. Is the CT conclusive in the first 24 hours in the diagnosis of the brain insult? Or MRI, the CT can might be normal in the first 24 hours for uh, strokes, ischemic strokes. You mean, right? Yes, I'm, I'm talking about ischemic strokes, of course. Yeah, sure. Because okay. the, the, the hemorrhage will, will will appear early. But what I mean that uh, the MRI, of course, would be better. But as we said, the first treatment of choice is the the first uh, investigation is to send the patient to the city. In a patient with uh, uh, acute uh, ischemic stroke, uh, do we uh, do we use aspirin, digagrol, anything, or what? Uh, besides yes. the other, uh, what are the drugs we can use? We can use immediately. Yes, we can. We can. We can give a loading dose of aspirin of three hundred uh, mg. But first we have to decide if this patient is going for uh, thrombolysis or no. Yeah. Because, because if thrombolysis, we better uh, delay the uh, start of the antiplatelet treatment. Okay. I think uh, we'll cover all the uh, questions here. Uh, Lastly, I thank you very much, Dr. Amr, for this thank you, sir. Uh, lecture. Thank you, Dr. Amr Hashim. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ali. Thank you, all the uh, attendees. That was a very everyone. nice uh, night and presentation. Thank you, and hope to see you in the next presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. See you.